that, uh, um, uh, okay, so let me remind you what we, what, what we saw in the last things. We performed this quantization of the bosonic stream. Uh, this quantization, uh, this quant we performed this quantization in an elaborate manner using this phase space quantization technique. Uh, but uh, let's now remember the end result. The end result was, uh, was as follows. The Hilbert space of our theory was made up of two in the infinity kinds of oscillators times functions in 26, uh, functions of uh, x or functions of p in d, in d variables, where d is the dimension of space. That was our Hilbert space. Okay? Now, uh, this Hilbert space was the Hilbert space of an, was, a, was too large Hilbert as we see from the fact that we have functions of d variables. The correct Hilbert space should have functions of d minus 1 variables. But, okay? And the fact that this Hilbert space was too large was, in, was, uh, was told to us by a constraint that we had to impose on this one theory. The constraint took the form of an operator equation that was, uh, was obeyed on states. Okay? And that operator equation well, there were two operator equations, one for left movers, one for right movers. Uh, and the operator equations were, so let's call this a tilde, and also alpha prime by 4 squared, is equal to alpha prime by 2, uh, 2n minus 3. Okay, just to remind you where all these terms came from. This term here was just the uh, you see, the, the constraint effectively was simply the Hamiltonian on the worksheet of the constraint is equal to zero. Or more precisely, the Hamiltonian could be written as a sum of a Hamiltonian for left movers and right, Hamiltonian for right movers. Independently, the left moving Hamiltonian and right moving Hamiltonian had to be zero. Okay? So these are the two, the, the two conditions, and the left moving Hamiltonian and right moving Hamiltonian zero. Okay? So let's remember what uh, all these contributions were. This mass squared term. Uh, so mass squared was was uh, uh, was minus p squared. And was simply the contribution to the Hamiltonian from the kinetic term uh, for the zero points. Okay? It's the same uh, this is the kind of Hamiltonian we got in particle mechanics. For the reason that we have similar branch into the zero modes as we had for the Okay? Um, uh, the, the factor of 4 is the fact that we've divided the Hamiltonian up into left moving and right moving part. But there we go, factor of 2. Fine. Okay. Uh, the stuff on the right hand side is new. Okay? The stuff on the right hand side is new. And it corresponds to the contribution of the Hamiltonian from the oscillators. Remember, in both for, for, for the left movers and the right movers, we have a sequence of oscillators of frequency 1, 2, 3, 4, up to infinity. N and N tilde here are shorthand notation which denotes the weighted occupation number of these oscillators. So let's write that down. N is equal to sum over little n, n, n. Uh, and tilde is equal to sum over n, n, n tilde, where n n is the occupation number of the the nth left moving oscillator. Similarly, n n tilde is the occupation number of the nth right moving oscillator. Okay, so uh, this is just a standard Hamiltonian of a system of harmonic oscillators. Omega, the frequency, and the occupation number. A sum of all the oscillators. Okay? So, what we had in the end was a bunch of oscill oscillators times the functions of 26 variables, and uh, a constraint imposed on the system, the constraint being Hamiltonian 0, which, which gave us this equation. Okay. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean physically? You see, this part, this p mu p mu is implemented on wave functions by differential operators. Okay? So, 
when you if you try to write down a wave function, a wave equation, you know, if you try to write down this constraint as a wave equation on states, you will get uh, if for a moment we concentrated on states with particular uh, that were eigenstates under these occupation numbers. What you would get from here would be two things. First, since we've got the same thing here and here, by subtracting these two equations, we come to the conclusion that the only allowed states are those for which the left moving occupation, you know, this left moving level number n, is equal to the right moving level number. Okay? So that's our first conclusion. n is equal to n tilde on a dot. And the second conclusion is that when this constraint is satisfied, the wave function of our system, in, uh, the wave function of the system in any particular state with a particular value for n and n tilde is the klein gordon equation, is the klein gordon equation for a particle of mass m squared is equal to, now let's get everything to this side, so 2 by, uh, 2 by alpha prime. Uh, into 2 n minus c minus 2 12, which is the same thing as 2 by alpha prime into 2 n because this equation simply becomes p squared plus n squared is equal to 0 with this particular value for the mass and that is the triangle equation for, for a massive particle, look at that. Is this here? Okay. So, uh, so what? What can we conclude? What's the physical interpretation of this system? The physical interpretation of this system is clear. What we have is a bunch of many different particles. How many different particles? Well, the particles are one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, uh, the occupation numbers of this infinite number of harmonics. Given any set of occupation numbers of left movers and occupation numbers of right movers, subject to this one constraint, only these are the only allowed occupation numbers. Okay? We have a particle of a given mass. Okay? What is the mass of the particle? It's equal to 2n minus d minus 2 by 12 times 2 by uh, 2 by alpha prime. And that particle moves freely in space. It obeys the time gordon equation with that mass. Okay? Different occupation numbers give you different particles, which typically have different masses. What is the largest mass of the system? At this level, there's no largest mass of the system. And can become as large as you want. Because occupation numbers are on the cost. It doesn't not happen from above. Okay? So, we've got an infinite number of particles of arbitrary high mass all fooling around with each other. Well, at the, at the level that we've discussed things, uh, these, these particles are free. So they're not interacting with each other. But, but of course, string theory is interesting because we can free ourselves of this free constraint and things will still start Okay? So, our, our, the, the quantization that we perform in this intuitive manner has given us already an interesting result. Okay? What we got is a, a system of, of particles, of free particles, an infinite number of them, of arbitrarily high mass, uh, all of which obey the free time of the equation. Is this clear? Questions or comments? Okay. Now, we've answered the question of what the highest mass is in the system. Now let's turn to the question of what is the lowest mass of the system? Okay? What's the lowest mass of the system? Well, we want the smallest value of n squared. Here, yeah, the smallest value of n squared occurs when n is equal to n tilde is equal to zero. None of the harmonic oscillators are occupied. In which case, we get m squared is equal to mm, minus 2 by alpha prime d minus. D minus 2 by 12. 
Okay. Now, the thing that's worrying about this formula is the minus sign. Um, <coughs> it's just a fact that the bosonic string, the string that we quantize, includes in the spectrum uh, a particle of negative mass, at least one particle. Particles of negative mass are called, have a name, they're called tachyons. Okay. Now, uh, negative mass sometimes brings to mind, a, especially the word tachyons, sometimes brings to mind uh, exotic phenomena like fastness, like motion. This is all wrong. You see, uh, negative mass, uh, in order to understand what it means for a particle to have negative mass, uh, you should think you should think of the mass as the second derivative of the potential for the particle for the high field for the field described in the particle about x equals zero, uh, about the value field equals zero. Okay. Generally speaking, I mean, if you've got a stable theory, a theory if you're if you're doing perturbation theory around a stable minimum, okay, then the second derivative is either zero or in most cases positive. So it tells you that you move your field a little bit away wants to roll back to find equals zero. Okay? The positivity of the, the second derivative is the mass squared, as we said, and the positivity of that second derivative is, is the positivity of mass. Uh, however, suppose you are doing an expansion, you are trying to do an expansion in perturbation theory about a potential which curves the other way, which is a negative, negative second derivative. If you wrote down the Lagrangian of the particle, truncated for a order, you would write down the Lagrangian of the particle with formally negative mass squared. What is negative mass squared telling you therefore? What it's telling you is that your per the point around which you're perturbing, you're, you're writing down a perturbation theory in your Lagrangian is not a stable limit. There's an unstable direction in which to move. You can see this clearly if you try to solve the equations of motion for a Klein Gordon system with negative mass squared, you find that at low enough uh, frequencies, low enough wave numbers, that wave number is smaller than mass. Uh, our wave, whatever, inverse, inverse wave length smaller than mass, uh, uh, you will find that uh, the solutions don't oscillate in time, but are exponentially grow and decay. Okay? Which is a characteristic of an unstable system. Okay, so while there's nothing pathological, there's no faster than light travel, nothing theoretically, patho you know, theoretically pathological about negative mass squares. It does indicate that, he, that if you're trying to do a perturbation expansion of some sort of theory, you started about a particularly unfortunate point. It tells you that you've started about you know, that point. If you want to deal with this, you should find the true minimum of the system if it exists, move there, and then do your expansion about it. Then you have all positive masses and you'll be able to do uh, a usual perturbation theory with no internet divergences. Okay? So, uh, we pick upon a, an unfortunate and, uh, and uh, undesirable feature immediately in our study of the bosonic string. Now, oh, the, 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 namely, the fact that we've discovered that we've got one uns at least one unstable direction in our, in our perturbation theory, we, we, this theory, whatever it is, we've, cho we've been unfortunate enough to expand this theory, whatever it is, we know what it is, uh, about an unstable point. Now, uh, this problem, well, the question of whether the bosonic string, the theory we are describing here, does have a good stable point about which to expand, or just some sick theory, you know, the maximum and the bottom, that's potential, is a fascinating question, which has not yet been resolved, in my opinion, uh, clearly one way or the other. Okay? However, uh, so, this, this theory that we've understood how to quantize in class so far uh, has not proved useful for physics so far. It's, it's just some, some formal thing. However, there is another system that is very closely related to this. A theory, uh, a world sheet theory is quantization is very similar to the one we performed, which includes, in addition to bosonic fields and the world sheet of, this, of the string, some fermionic fields. Okay? In that system, this problem goes away. Okay? So, all the physics that is done with string theory and with perturbative string theory is done with the fermionic string. The string theory that does not have this problem. Okay? However, 
Uh, dealing with that string is technically complicated by the fact that you have to deal with fermions and the fact that you have to introduce notions of supersymmetry. Because the, 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 this, this, the string on the, on the, well, the, the action of the Welsh string is supersymmetric and sort of unnatural to talk about that without giving you a little introduction to supersymmetry. Okay? So, uh, in, in any course of string theory, you're faced with this, these crossroads and different times of teaching this course have, have chosen to go different ways. But this time we're going to go along the route of Polchinski. And so we're going to say, look, believe me, that when you grow up a couple of months from now, or three months from now, <laughs> we will tell you about the string that doesn't have this problem. So even though it's a problem and it means we can't do real physics with this system, allow me to forget about that fact and go on with the system. Because you will learn in a simple, a technically simpler setting, many lessons that will be useful, that you will be able to bodily carry over into the more complicated setting uh, where, where you have a string with fermions of the world sheet and you have no, no technicals. Okay? So actually I've never taught the course this way. But partly because when I was a student I found it very unsatisfying. But uh, one should experiment in life, so this, this is the way we're going to teach. Now we're going to go this, this way. Okay? Regarding uh, whether we have chosen in the wrong vacuum in uh, the sonic, uh, sonic string theory, yes. uh, can we uh, really answer it without going into string field theory? I mean, from uh, remaining within the realm of string quantum mechanics? Well, you see, one way to try to answer this might be using the normalization group techniques of the world sheet. You know, the most, uh, while string field theory is proved very useful in studying open string theory, uh, is uh, spectacular condensation into the open string. It's not proved very useful so far uh, in, with the study of uh, uh, tachyon compensation for closed strings. The techniques that proved useful there have been different techniques. The techniques that try, uh, that try to go off shell by using renormalization group flow techniques to well shape the string, which are purely first one type techniques. Okay? So uh, I would say that that is, you know, for instance, the Adam uh, Kulchinsky Silverstein paper that describe the decay of cones to flat space, use that technique. Now, I would say so that the techniques are not a barrier. There's no conceptual barrier for techniques here. Yeah? I think first one type string theory might well be enough. Uh, it's just that either it's just that nobody's come up with a good way of addressing this question so far. It's very possible that the bosonic string is just itself, you know, just by itself a single theory. Okay? On the other hand, uh, you know, as, as, as we can see, we, we, we go for months studying this theory, and apart from the tachyon, we find no other problem. Somehow I find that it could be that it plays into the game in some way. But basically, you know, nothing is not about it. Mm. Okay, uh, good question. Other questions on it. Okay, so I'm going to ask your lead to, to suppress your discomfort with the fact that we're working about an unstable minimum, and let me continue for the next two or three months. And then we come back and your own Okay, good. So that's fine. So we've got a lowest mass particle with uh, uh, just indicates instability. Okay, but let's look at the next part. Okay? Uh, other problems will also be the next part. So let's set n is equal to n tilde. This we can do, remember, because we've got a harmonic oscillator with frequency 1. So we can excite one unit that that happens. Okay, then what do we get? Okay, so firstly let's count how many such how many such uh, objects we have. Well, we had twenty we had d minus two options. Remember what we could do? What state is this? This is alpha i, and we call this um, uh, minus one on zero, alpha tilde j minus one. Remember our notation? This minus one was uh, uh, the length of was we minuses were creation operators. One, two, three, four label the frequency of the oscillator. Okay? So I've acted on vacuum with the creation of one creation operator of frequency minus one on the left, of frequency one on the left, and one creation operator of frequency one on the right. Clearly this sets n equals one. And n tilde. Clearly, this is also the only way of getting n equals 1 and n tilde equals 1. 
because you're either excited two more excitations of the harmonic oscillator frequency one or one excitation of the harmonic oscillator any other frequency you would go about it equal to one okay so if we go to the next mass level because what is that mass that x squared is equal to uh, 2 minus d minus 2 over 12 we find that the number of such particles the number of particles that, that we have here is 24 into 24. Because each of i and j run over 24. d minus 2 is d minus 2. Sorry. Uh, d minus 2 into d minus 2. Z two over each of i and j run over d minus 2 values. Okay? We've got so many components of the part. Yeah, so many fields for a particle of this class. Now, there seems to be a more serious, if you look at this answer, there seems to be a more serious problem with this answer than the problem of the instability of the tank. And this problem seems, is, uh, this, this, this problem, this problem that, uh, that, that, that appears when you look at it, it is the following. Look, this particle, wherever it is, this particle, wherever it is, clearly transforms under space-time relations because it has a vector index times another vector index. Okay? But the particle appears to be one of non-zero mass. We'll come back to that in a moment. And now, the problem is the following. You see, it's a general property from, from group theory from the study of the representations of the Poincaré group, that massive particles transform in representations of SO d minus one. Is this familiar to? Is, is this familiar to? You? you know, basically what I'm saying is that you know, when you look at the, the wave functions of a particle, you have both its momentum as well as its spin directions. Okay. But you can always go to a frame in which the momentum is zero. And in that frame, the, the part of the Lorentz group that's unbroken by this choice of frame is rotations. So rotations must be expressed. You know, this particle must transform in some representation of this, of this remaining unbroken rotation group, which is SOD minus 1. Okay, now how many of you are familiar with this beginner theory of uh, representations of uh, uh, the Pankari? It's only a little Oh, a little bit. Okay, this is something I, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to teach teach it here. It would long, but it's something I strongly recommend. That you know about. Okay, representations of the point Okay, which tell you that in general, in, uh, for a massive particle in these dimensions, uh, uh, it must transform in representations of S O D minus uh, D minus one. Okay, uh, uh, this is. In four dimensions, that's familiar analog, the massive particles transform in representations of XL3. Okay, now, this seems like a problem because th these states here clearly do not transform in representations of XL3. Okay, uh, so let, let me work the problem by suppressing the fact that they're, they're both left movers and right movers. Okay, let me think, think of just left movers. Okay. You've, got, you've got objects, you've got 24 different states, d minus 2 different states, each of which clearly, uh, and these states clearly transform in a vectorial representation of x of d minus 2. Okay? Now you can ask, is there any, any d minus 2 dimensional representation of x of d minus 1 such that it includes all the states transform as vector of S O D minus 2 and there are no other states and clearly the answer is no. The nearest thing to this kind of representation is a vector of S O D minus 1 which in addition to these D minus 2 states which transform as vector of S O D minus 2 include a state which would be singular to S O D minus 2 but is needed to complete the multiplet into full vector of S O D minus 1. Is this clear? Good. See, suppose you 
got some big SO. Let's say SO D minus 1. Okay? And let's break this up into, into one row and one column. And uh, so this is 1, and this is D minus 2. D minus 2. That's 1. Okay. Now, we've got, we look at, let's look at a familiar representation of SO D minus 1, namely the Victorian. How many elements does this have? It has d minus 1 elements. Okay. These d minus 1 elements can be formed as this column. All these d minus 1 elements, with this choice of breaking s of d minus 1 up into s of d minus 2 other stuff, these guys transform as a vector of s of d minus 2. Okay? But there's one more element in the representation that under s of d minus 2 is a singlet. Is this clear? So there is a representation of x to d minus one that includes that when you when you you know break it up into representations of x to d minus two includes the vector vectorial representation. But you know, uh, but this representation has at least has exactly one more element. Okay, and of course, if you think about it, you, you will convince yourself that there is no representation of x to d minus one that has twenty four elements. That has d minus two elements, all, all of which transform in a uh, in a, uh, vectorial representation of s of d minus one, uh, d minus two. That's impossible, right? It's breaking the symmetry between the, the d minus two dimensions and the remaining one dimension. Okay. So uh, this confusion is not changed when you tensor this thing with something else from the right hand side. So we conclude that the states that we've got at level one do not transform in representations of S of D minus 1. Now, this is a direct contradiction with some general theorem about how particles in D minus 1 dimensions, in a Lorentz invariant theory, D minus 1, you know, in D space time dimensions should behave. And so it looks like a contradiction that's more serious than instability. It looks just like you're getting something wrong. And you might ask, is there any way around it? Now, there is a way around it. And the way is an interesting one. You see, uh, everything I said about particles transforming representations of SOD minus 1 is true for massive particles. But it's not true for massless particles. You see, the intuition is that while it's always possible to get into the rest frame of a, ma a massive particle, that's not possible for a massless particle. The best you can do is use the rest transformations to make sure that the momentum of the massless particle is in one particular direction. Let's say the D minus 1 of there. Okay? Now, once you make this choice of frame, the rotational part of the symmetry that you have left is S O D minus 2 rather than S O D minus 1. Is this clear? Because time is special and the x direction is special, D minus 1 is direction is special, the other directions are all equal. Okay? So, and this intuition is turns out to be correct. Meaner's general analysis tells you that massless particles. Fields for massless particles transform in representations of x of d minus 2 rather than this. Okay. So, perhaps this is what's going on. Okay? Perhaps what's going on is that this particle at level 1 is massless. If that were true, all of this would be consistent. Okay? Now, if that, when would that be true? Well, it would only be true if 24 was equal to d minus 2. So it would only be true if d was equal to 26. Okay? So, we tentatively move on here. We say, well, let us, uh, this whole thing doesn't seem to make any sense unless, let us level 1, uh, we have massless particles. And perhaps we can be, mm, you know, we can respect Lorentz invariance and meet us there. Okay, but you might think now we're in a very slippery slope. Because you might think, well, the way we've done things, we always have things that are manifesting representations of SLD minus 2, but you're going to have a hard time building things up in representations of SLD minus 1. You've gone out of, you've wheeled out of it 
at level 1 by saying this guy is masterless, but unfortunately, if you're masterless at level 1, you can't be masterless at level 2. So what are you going to do with the next level? So let's see. So there's a question here. So let's work with level 2. So now we're going to with n equals to n delta. Now what? Firstly, let's list all the states that we have here. Okay? Uh, I'm going to just list the left movers. We're going to tensor this with whatever we have with the same thing on the, for the right movers. Okay? All the groups here, everything works sector by sector. So let's just list that. Yeah. But firstly, we have alpha minus 1 i, alpha minus 1 j. And from the back. Is there anything else we have left? Very good. We also have alpha i minus 2. Now, now you might think, well, well, we've got everything in representation to x only minus 2. Uh, it would be a miracle if it transforms in the representation of x only minus 1. But let's see if this miracle is indeed. Is indeed true. So let's look at a particular representation of x only minus 1. Namely, the symmetric traceless representation of x only minus 1. Okay? What is that? Its, its elements are matrices, are d minus 1 times d minus 1 dimensional matrices, that are symmetric and traces. Okay? This is unlike the representation we looked at before, which is just a column. It's a bigger representation. It's a matrix. Okay, and let's take this representation and break it out into representations of x of d minus, uh, of x of d minus 2. Okay. Now, let's see. We've got a matrix here. So, this part, so once again, we take this matrix and break it up into 1 and d minus 2, and 1 and d minus 2. Okay, so this is d minus 2 times d minus 2 matrix. Is this clear? Okay, now clearly, something that was symmetric in the full space remains symmetric in this space. So this thing here is a symmetric matrix of S of D minus 2. This is not traceless, not necessarily traceless. The trace condition of the full space tells you that this element plus the trace is zero. Okay? But by agreeing to take, you know, so so the trace is not zero, but it's related to what's happening here. So it's not an independent degree of freedom. Okay? So, in counting representations, we, we can remove the trace if we agree to count this element. Okay, so the question I'm asking now is if you have the symmetric traceless representation of SOD minus 1, what representations of SOD minus 2 does it break out? So, what do we have? Well, we've got the symmetric tensor of SOD minus 2. Let's remove its trace. So, that's the trace, the sublinear combination of the trace in this guy is a scalar. Plus, we got these rows and these columns. Because the original matrix was symmetric, they equal each other, so we count only one of them. So the net, the net conclusion is, what, is that what we've got is a symmetric traceless representation, a scalar, and a vector. <coughs> okay? So what we concluded, we concluded that some traceless of d minus 1 is equal to sim traceless or decomposes into strip traceless of d minus 2 plus uh, vector of d minus 2 plus scalar of d minus 2. This is clear. No matter where unhappy. Okay, uh, if you want to convince yourself by counting components that the com component counting matches, the, the formula you have to verify is that uh, d minus 1 into d by 2 minus 1, so that trick trace is tensor d minus 1, is equal to d minus 2 times d minus 1 by 2 plus d plus 1 
which I can't do in real time, but uh, presumably is true. Sorry, and this is this plus d minus. Then maybe I can. <laughs> okay, we can take the sub common. O. Just, but in order to answer that question, we have to do a little 
That's why I think the most serious job of the quantization is to be. Okay? Uh, but let me give you a very rough answer to that question immediately. You remember that uh, uh, in, this, in this procedure of quantizing the string, uh, the place we got as minus 1 12th from included a physical assumption. That was the assumption of conformal invariance of the word shape of the string. That was the thing that uniquely fixed. That was the, uni the thing that uniquely fixed 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals minus 1 over 12. Okay, now the, conf the conformal invariance that, that, that we wanted was a consequence of symmetries that we wanted to inform, that we wanted to have, wanted to keep, uh, keep true in our quantization. These symmetries were retired metrization invariance in the word shape string and wild invariance on the word shape string. Okay, so while it is true that these two symmetries are only maintained provided that d is equal, uh, provided that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is equal to minus 1 over 12. This turns out not to be the only condition. If you do a more serious job analyzing the path and text of this theory and asking the wild invariance and the uh, diffeomorphism invariance and the word shape of the string remain symmetries of the theory, you require, in addition to this fact, you require that d is equal to 26. How that comes about, we will see in the next few lectures after we understand the little form. Okay? But uh, I just wanted to assure you at this point that there is a systematic procedure that if you do the if you do things more seriously, you will see where the procedure your uh, things break down, unless D is equal to 26. So D equals 26 has another more satisfying derivation, which we will get to uh, right. Okay. But one of that, uh, one of that. Uh, we're happy with our quantization of the string. Okay? And now let's immediately look at look to see uh, to see what the consequence, what the result that we've got is. So we've got this one unstable particle which we decided not to bother with. But here we've got some massless particles. That's nice. Massless particles are always interesting. They're always really interesting physics. So let's understand exactly what the massless particles we have found. Okay. So the massless particles, remember, were, a, were in the 24 times 24 of SL24, the vector times the vector of SL24. Now if you try to take this vector times vector and decompose it in irreducible representations, can somebody do that for me? Can somebody decompose vector times vector in irreducible representations? Any SO group? Very good. Very good. Symmetric tensor, uh, tracer symmetric tensor, anti symmetric tensor, and the tricks. Okay. So, what we get here is uh, under SO24, we've got a traceless symmetric tensor, an anti symmetric tensor, and a tricks. The point is, okay, these two, the fields associated with with the, the anti-symmetric tensor as a name is called BQU, you know, and we'll encounter it in many, many guises as we go along in our standard string theory. Uh, the field associated with the trace also has a name, it's an important field, it's called the dilatum. We'll encounter it even more as we go along in our standard string theory. But the thing I want to focus on at the moment is this tracer symmetric. Okay, this the traceless symmetric tensor is very interesting. Uh, uh, it's very interesting because uh, because if you take Einstein gravity and linearize it, okay, to linearize it look at small fluctuations, and you ask in what representation physical excitations, you know, physics, uh, physical physical. Uh, uh, excitations of the gravitons transform in, in three dimensions. The answer to that question is in the traceless symmetric rep uh, uh, tensor representation of, of SOD minus 2. Okay? So the fact that we've got a symmetric tensor floating around the place, the fact that we've got a symmetric tensor floating around the place, is uh, a tantalizing indication 
that we may be dealing a masterless symmetric tensor protein. That's really crucial. Okay. It's a tantalizing indication that we may be dealing with a theory of kinetic. Okay. Now, it may be more than an indication. Um, there are various claims whose levels of, uh, you know, how much you should believe these claims up to the reader. But there are various claims, uh, the most systematic of them being by Feynman in, in, the, in this book by that is called Lectures of Gravitation. Okay? There are various claims by various people, most systematically by Feynman, that if you want to study that any theory that includes massless symmetric fields and is a consistent unitary quantum, makes up a consistent unitary quantum field theory, okay, must be a theory of gravity. In uh, and what do I mean by theory of gravity? In the sense that it must must implement diffeomorphism invariance. Okay. Let us, for our generalized purposes, talk about any theory that is invariant, you know, meant that that implements diffeomorphism invariance as a theory of gravity. Okay. Uh, so the various claims floating around that, that say that if you have the only way to make a consistent quantum theory of of massless fields in uh, massless things of fields. Okay, uh, is uh, by making it a theory of gravity. Let me give you a one minute introduction to the to the uh, idea behind these claims. The idea behind these claims is, is very similar to the idea behind well, a similarly a similar likely to be true statement about vector fields. You know, suppose you take a theory, uh, a quantum field theory involving vector fields, a theory involving in here. Okay. And you canonically quantize it. When you do the canonical quantization in a vector method fashion, you get uh, uh, a mu data. You know, you get uh, uh, you uh, you get okay, and you define a mu dagger your a mu as the uh, as the object that anchors vacuum. So that's great, great translator. You get the canonical computation relation a mu a mu dagger equals dagger equals eta mu nu. Okay, what else could it have been? It looks like the rest. Now why when we when this is when mu and mu are spatial indices, this is a standard computation relation for an harmonic oscillator. When mu and mu is done, these are the wrong computation relations for Okay? It's for time this becomes annihilation of creation is equal to one. Rather than creation with annihilation. Okay? And that leads to all kinds of trouble. Basically conflict with conflict with unitarity, with boundedness of the energy spectrum. Okay. So you might think that it's really hard to build because of this problem. You might think that it's pretty hard to build a consistent quantum theory with uh, uh, massless electromagnetic fields, with massless vector fields. And uh, uh, the fix to this turns out to be the fix to this turns out to be, uh, and, it, and it is hard to build a theory. You know, it, the theory just says that the Lagrangian del a mu the whole thing squared makes no sense. But uh, there is a fix to this, and that is. Introduce a date symmetry into the problem, which allows you, to, which is so large that it allows you to degree the, uh, eliminate the time like degree of freedom. This is the usual Maxwell gate gate symmetry. If you eliminate the time like degree of freedom, then you have only states for positive norm and you have no trouble. Okay, the problem is even more serious when you look at the theory of gravity, when, when you look at the theory based on symmetric tensors. Because if you look at the theory based on symmetric tensors. You got T plus A mu nu A alpha beta, and then this has got to be A mu uh, eta mu alpha eta uh, mu beta plus symmetric. Uh, what? One of them should be that. One of them should be that. Okay. And once again, these are perfectly sensible canonical computation relations where everything is space. 
or actually in this case for both are time. Because then there are two minus times. So when you have one space and one time, you have trouble. Okay, you get the wrong sign of it, computation relations. Okay? And uh, uh, in order to cure that, you need a gauge in there once again. Something that will allow you to eliminate the bad degrees of freedom. And basically, uh, the, the, these arguments are trying to show that the only way to make sense of a masterless blah 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 theory, uh, try to argue that the only consistent gauge invariance in this theory is certain degree of officers. Which is, a, is an accident. Okay. Now, I don't want to, want to go on with these, with these general arguments very much, because who knows whether they're true, you know, such general arguments or, or make lots of assumptions that assumptions might be violated and so on. However, the, the basic idea seems flawed. It seems hard to make, certainly there are no examples, of theories, interaction theories, you know, uh, interesting theories with uh, uh, symmetric, uh, symmetric fields that are massless and that don't have different properties in there, therefore not in its crap. Okay, so this is a strong, the fact that the bosonic string has massless symmetric particles is a stronger indication than you may first find out. Okay, that it is a theory. Okay, however, of course, we will see this in much more detail than these words. We will see as we go along in our study that we have what we build this theory around. Uh, supposing, you know, I mean, okay, this is probably support with us. Supposing it turns out that whatever we see is quantum mechanics. Turns out to be a very special piece of classical theory. I mean, then does that violate Bell's inequalities? I mean, I have rather a model. Yeah, I, I think that's. I mean, well, I I, I, I don't know that much about it either, but uh, uh, it's not easy to uh, reproduce quantum mechanics by any classical theory, right? I mean, there were these sharp inequalities that were tested experimentally. So that any classical theory, you get something less than this. In the quantum theory, you get something that violates that bound. The test it. It's not, you know. I'm asking this because I mean, most of the time, for the actions, kind of actions we deal with, they are not very classical things. Yes, yes, yes. But but there's a context. Somehow it seems to work. What seems to work? I mean, the classical actions and now that we the zero. Well, you know, you know, any quantum system which is weakly enough coupled with the nature or small enough is approximately classical. And as far as classical limit. So that's true, but this stop, you know, spoil the fact that it is quantum. You know, I mean, it's just how weird quantum, quantum physics is from a classical point of view is really well emphasized by these lectures that Feynman gave, uh, you know, in Feynman lectures of physics, the first three chapters of volume three, in which he tried to Track down which hole in the bullet is. It's, you know, maybe if you make things weird enough, you can make them. It's not easy. Quantum mechanics is very different from classical mechanics in rather important ways. Also, as fine, those lectures emphasize it. It's never consistent in, quantum, in the quantum theory to have half the word quantum and the other half less. That's never consistent. Can somebody tell? Okay, we'll take two minute break just to answer this question. Uh, uh, can somebody give me an argument? A simple physical argument that, tell, that tells you that's not going to be inconsistent if, some, if there was anything classical. Okay, let's, let's, let's be clear. If gravity was classical, anything else was one, could this be consistent? It would make sense. I mean, in all the landscapes, you know, suddenly, I mean, there should be, you know, how can the theory be suddenly be different in certain landscapes? Okay, but, but, but we want a sharper argument. I mean, if it has to be classical at one place, then it has to be classical at all things. Why? Because the uncertainty depends. The uncertainty depends on the Good, can you sharpen that? Basically, you can make gravitational measurements, and scale measurements. That's, that's exactly right. Let me just say that. Let, let me just say that more, more in, you know, in, in the context of given experiment. So, the experiment the final told you, told us about, you know, those lectures. If you remember, he was dealing with a double slit experiment. Okay? He was dealing with a double slit experiment and he was throwing, I don't know, electrons at the slit. And he was finding that if he had just one of these slits, he got a curve like this, another slit, he got a curve like this, 
to the same size of the overlapping set of curves. Okay. But if we have both of them open, you got a curve like, like this. Like of interference. And this, he was very puzzled by it. So he's saying, well, presumably electrons are either going through that slit or go through that slit. Presumably the electrons that go through this slit don't know or care whether this one's open or not. So how can it be that what you get when both slits are open is different from the sum of what you get when each one is open? And then he tried to track it down, you know, with an experiment. He said, well, let, let me do the following. Let me keep both slits open, but see which one the which one the electrons go through. If I can do that, it must be that I get the sum of those that go through the first plus those that go through the second. Okay, so how do you try to do, uh, to, to do, do the scene? Try to do that by taking a photon gun, you know, and shooting, shooting these photons at the electron. And then measuring the scatter photon. From different difference in direction from which the photons came, you can see which one the electron might have. Okay, but then he had a problem. He had a problem because if he chose the photons to be too small in wavelength, then the kick they carried was so strong that it could take an electron that was headed there and make it head here. But strong enough to kick the electrons enough to smear out the interference pattern. On the other hand, if he made the, uh, the photons too large, because of the big wavelength of the photons, you couldn't detect which, where, you know, the, the direction of the measurement was not sensitive enough to say whether the photon was coming from being scattered from here or from there. And it was precisely at this point, I mean, if you try to make the photons large enough so that you couldn't, you didn't kick the electrons enough to smear off the interference pattern, you made them so large that you couldn't detect which electron they, which, which slit the electron came through. So as a function of photon size, as you took the photons very small, you would be able to see the electrons, you would be able to see which slit the electrons came through, and you would find this interference pattern, some of these slits. Then you make the uh, photons larger and larger and larger and larger. Your resolution of where they came through becomes lower and lower and lower, lower and the pattern becomes nearer and nearer to this. Okay? Quantum mechanics lives on the edge of not making sense. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very finely tuned theory. <laughs> okay? Now, suppose these photons have been classical. Then you see, you can make the photons very small and yet very small energy. Making them very small, you'd be able to detect it, which slit the electron came through. Making them very small energy, you would kick the electron almost not at all. So had you had quantum electrons interacting with classical photons, the theory wouldn't have made sense. Or at least would have to be greatly different. Okay? Everything has your photons is true of gravitons. You know, it just wouldn't work in quantum mechanics if you had some particles of classical numbers that work. Precisely because you would buy the answer. Okay, uh, so, so that was a philosophical aside. Uh, 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 but, uh, but okay, good. Not the need for what, but good. Uh, okay, any other questions or comments before? Okay, so we've completed our little mini round one. We've completed a little quantization of the bosonic strength, and we've seen the result. We've seen that we get masses into particles, so presumably that counts. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to go back and do things more systematically um, through a more detailed study of the kind of quantum theory that lives in the world shape string, the ethical form theory. So that's the plan for the next few lectures, a uh, relatively thorough study of the form theory. Okay? So let's go. theory, um, and much of what we do in this course, uh, which is quantum mechanical, uh, will be done following Pulchinsky. Okay, so now from now on I'm following Pulchinsky chapter 2, so perhaps not in the order that Pulchinsky chapter 2 is written, which I find a very convoluted one. That's what it says in the camera. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, okay, so um, uh, the 
the uh, uh, this, 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 the study of uh, of conformity theory that much, much of the other quantum mechanics we do will be uh, using the path integral for projection of quantum mechanics. Okay, so partly as a warm up in the, in using path integrals, but largely because we need the results. And now we can use path integrals to derive two or three results, you know famous results in classic in quantum and they have analog of quite classical field theories uh, related to symmetries. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is to derive the normal theorem. Okay, uh, using the path integral from quantum mechanics of quantum field theories. Okay, so first of all, you know, what is the path integral formulation? Well, you know, there's some partition function which is defined by an integral over fields and an exponential of i times an action, which is function. In quantum mechanics, those fields are functions of time only. In quantum field theory, those fields are functions of both time and certain number of space dimensions. We're working in one plus one dimensions, so our fields will generally be functions of time and one space dimension. Okay. Now, uh, Interesting objects in, in, that you compute in quantum, in quantum field theory and will be of great interest to us as we move on in the course, as you will see, are correlation functions. That is, objects of the following form uh, So let's define terms. X1 and X, X1 and X are positions on the field theory space, which in this case is two-dimensional. Okay. I often use the, the symbol X to denote both the space and time. It's X mean. Okay. Now what are these O's? These O's are any local function of the field. Okay. So uh, O's are called operators, local operators. And for instance, if the fields of the theory as will be the case in the Bodham experiment that we studied are x mu of sigma 1 and sigma 2 or sigma 1 tau, then you can make many local operators out of x mu. For instance, you can make the operator, well, x mu itself is an operator. You could make operators like del alpha of x mu at a at given point in space, or you could take even by i k that x at that same point in space and so the yeah, any functions of the axis that depend only on the value of the x at the particular point of interest and is, is, is immediately okay, so depends on the fields and derivatives of the fields that are ok so as we will see as we go along the combination of correlation functions for the action of the well shape of the string will, will be very important to us. Okay, so, uh, oh sorry, these co correlation functions often divide, uh, define after dividing the function So now we're going to try to, we're going to try now to, uh, okay, uh, something that I will uh, uh, often do in this course is work interchangeably with the Lorentzian and Euclidean formulations of quantum mechanics. Okay, so some I, you might find me switching this I S to minus S, in which case I'm working with the Euclidean action. Okay, when we actually move from Lorentz, the, when we actually need it for physics, that is, when we actually use Euclidean action for the world sheet of the string to order to do a calculation, we justify this very carefully. You know, why the physical calculation that we want to do, which is a Lorentzian calculation, can equal, equally be well done in a Euclidean setting, but until we get there, formal purposes, you know, uh, the manipulations I will do will sometimes be Lorentzian, sometimes be Euclidean space, sometimes it won't matter, sometimes it will. Okay, so for manipulation purposes, for formal purposes, I, I will often work in Euclidean, the Euclidean theory. In order to answer physical question, we must be very careful about what we're doing, and we always do that. 
Okay? But the next few lectures, the next five lectures or so, will be about conformal field theory, we'll be doing no string theory, we'll, we'll look at the application of this to the study of string theory only five lectures from now. Okay? So it will be hard for, in the next five lectures to answer questions like, where will this go into string theory? Or why is this the correct thing to do from the point of view of string theory? Because, you know, we, we get to that only five lectures. Yeah? So this is formal exercise to study the kind of quantum field theory at the moment. Of course, the reason we're studying this is this kind of quantum field theory that appears in Okay, then. So, we will be interested in these objects uh, in quantum field theory. Now, I want to uh, de derive certain well known, but anyway, it's just set notation, in case you haven't seen this way of deriving it, it's well known, it's useful. Um, uh, properties of these correlation functions um, implied by the existence of symmetry. Implied by the existence of symmetry uh, in the theory. Okay, so first we have to define the what is symmetry. So now consider the partition function here that takes this form. Now suppose we can find a variable change as to some function of x prime. Okay? Such that under the variable change, the part integral takes the same functional form when expressed in terms of x prime as it took when, it, uh, uh, when expressed in terms of x. That is, then, if you just make this variable change into this integral, it turns into the integral dx prime exponential of minus s. I emphasize that what I'm talking about here is functional form. Because all I've done is a variable change. A variable change can't change the value of an integral. Of course, whether you make a variable change by symmetry or by anything else, the value of the integral hasn't changed. But most variable changes will change the form of the integral. Okay? If you, if you can find symmetry uh, variable changes that don't change the form of the integral, you do. It's the same function, the integral is unchanged. Okay? Such a, such a, such a variable change is called a symmetry of a part. Now, why are symmetries interesting? Symmetries are interesting because they're associated with conservation laws and related to water. Okay? So let's try to understand. So, um, firstly, uh, we will be interested mainly in continuous symmetry. So symmetry is that depend on one parameter, that when, when this parameter is taken to zero, it will take you to the identity transformation. Okay. So for such symmetries, we can take the value of this parameter to be very small. So infinitesimally, our uh, variable change takes the form, and uh, x is equal to x prime plus epsilon times some g. Okay? So, uh, in, so in particular, it's true that if we make this variable change, I, uh, just a second, then uh, when you wrote z as uh, z in terms of x prime, you yeah. are not imposing a symmetry here. Well, what, there is a symmetry if there exists a variable change such that if I change, make a variable change, the integral it does not change. Yeah. Okay, that's what it means for that is symmetry. Okay? Given an arbitrary path integral that may or may not exist in it. Because variable change of identity, something is equal to itself, always exists, but that's true. We want more. Okay? So we're looking at, at uh, um, symmetries that, that have infinite versions. So uh, that, that such that a variable change takes that form. That takes that form. Okay. Now, what consequence, consequence can we draw from the path integral using the fact Yes. So now this is this is as, this is symmetry. After you've taken care of the Jacobian, this result is true. Okay. So once you have re-expressed everything in terms of the x prime, what you have here should be e to the power minus. Prime. There are many ways in which it could happen. Could be that the Jacobian is one and the action is one. Could be that the Jacobian is not true. The action is not true. Changes, but the two cancel. Both forms are interesting and uh, 
See, in quantum mechanics, all that is important is the path integral. The action separately, the measure separately are not distinguished. Okay, good. So now let's move on. So, uh, so, so let's take, make an infinitesimal variable change of this form. If our action was, uh, if our theory was, you know, if 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 we have a symmetry, then making this variable change, we get the same, we get we get the same partition function in terms of okay, of, of x prime. But now, okay, that that hasn't taught us very much yet. But now we will do the following. Let's take this epsilon, which was a constant in order for this thing to be a symmetry, and make it a function of field theory coordinates. Okay? So let's perform the variable change. X is equal to x prime plus epsilon of, let's call it sigma alpha, g of x. And examine what happens to the path of table under this variable change. So what do we get? We know that if epsilon is constant, making the variable change simply gives us the x prime exponential of i and s of x prime. Okay, let me do the, the argument will always be pleasing to this. There will be fewer i's. Okay? e to the power minus s of x prime. Okay, this would be true if epsilon was constant. Well, epsilon is not a constant the, because that is not necessarily symmetry of the action. We will get a change, but that change must be proportional to a derivative of epsilon. To re reduce to the fact that when epsilon was a constant, we got no change. So, the most general thing must be del alpha epsilon and some function j alpha of x. This is it. Of course, you might ask, what if it has two derivatives of uh, a function that is two derivatives of epsilon? And, and the answer is, well, if it has two derivatives, you can by the way, by God's transform out of the derivatives instead. There's must have at least one derivative. No claim that it has one exactly. Okay? You might also ask, well, uh, why is this exponentiated? Why, why not in the numerator? Why not take it downstairs? The answer is the first order in epsilon, which is where we're working, is no difference. Yeah, you can put things wherever you want. Okay? Good. So, this is what we, what we got upon making the variable change uh, uh, in the action, in, in the partition function. But, of course, since it's a variable change, the value of the partition function has to change. Okay? So this is the same thing as integral dx exponential of minus s of x, the original property expression for the partition function. These two are as an expression equal. Now let me change, make a change of dummy variables and call x prime equals x. And then subtract these two expressions. So we get the equation, we get the equation dx. Mm. Exponential of minus x minus s of x, and then we have a one. Uh, let's let's expand this, you know, leading order of epsilon. So we have one plus this business. So the one term, the cancel the term that was one cancels. We need a subtraction. That that business survives. So uh, times integral del alpha epsilon j alpha of x. Is equal to zero. This is true for any function that we choose for epsilon, and therefore we conclude that the expectation value. Oh, now let's integrate this by parts. So let's integrate this by parts. So we get epsilon here, del alpha here, with a minus sign here. Okay. Okay, uh, we can choose epsilon to be anything you want, a delta function in particular. That gives us the expectation value of del alpha j alpha equals zero. <coughs> okay, so we have to, we have reached our first conclusion. Our first conclusion is that every time we have a symmetry inside the path integral, 
that implies the existence of conserved charge. Uh, we've not fully proved that yet. We've only seen that it implies the existence of a charge, charge whose ex color, uh, that has a charge whose expectation value vanishes. Uh, whose expectation value of divergence vanishes. Because we want more. But is this observation just function or is it kind of it? No, it's just function. I mean, yeah, exactly. well, we, we, uh, well, we'll see exactly how. In the quantum theory, you know, the classical analog of the statement certainly is not valid if you violate the equations. Okay? And we'll see exactly how on shell the statement is. Okay, now, this is an interesting statement, but, all, but as we said, the thing that we are often really interested is expectation values of various operators. So the thing that would be more useful to have is a statement about what del alpha j alpha times O1 ON gives. So what is this? That would be the more interesting thing. Now, how do we answer this question? Well, let's try the same manipulation as we did above, but by inserting some operators uh, into the problem. Okay, so suppose we start with that we take z, which is 